Hey everyone, Noah Zerby here. This is one of a series of short videos looking at game theory and international relations. Uh, in this video, we're going to look at some of the solutions to the prisoner's dilemma. We look at the prisoner dilemma itself in another video, so if you haven't seen that video, you may want to start there and then come here. But if you're ready, let's get started. You'll recall from our previous videos that the prisoner's dilemma describes a specific situation in which rational decisions lead to irrational outcomes. And we can use it to make sense of a host of situations in national and international society, from inaction on climate change to nuclear arms races. But the question I want to look at in this video is, how can we prevent this from happening? That is, how can we overcome the problems associated with the prisoner's dilemma and move towards or secure cooperation in global politics? Game theory argues that there are a number of strategies that we can use to incentivize cooperation in the prisoner's dilemma and perhaps more broadly in global politics. The first solution is to permit iteration. Most games are rarely one-shot events. The US and the Soviet Union engaged in negotiations and had relationships across a number of issue areas, repeating interactions over time. Repeated interactions, or iterations, permitted trust to develop. That trust provided the foundation for the development of long-term relationships and trade-offs over time, reducing incentives to defect from the cooperative solution. Thus, in nuclear politics, we see gradual rounds of talks between the U.S. and the USSR, leading to progressively more comprehensive treaties and larger reductions over time. We can see similar logic at play in the successive rounds of trade talks under the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, or GATT. Early rounds involved a limited number of concessions in an effort to develop a trust that would lead to broader agreement in later rounds. Iteration, or playing successive rounds of the game, permits that trust to develop. Similarly, communication is also important. You'll remember from the hypothetical example that prisoners were not allowed to communicate with each other, thus preventing the coordination of strategies. But in the real world, we're rarely in situations where we can't communicate, discuss options, coordinate strategy, or develop common positions. Now, communication alone may not prevent the prisoner's dilemma from occurring, particularly if the payoff structure remains unchanged. There are still incentives to defect from cooperation. And that's why changing the payoff structure is so important. If we can find ways to reduce the cost of cooperation or to increase the cost of defection, we can create different incentives that may induce different decisions and outcomes. In game theoretic terms, this means messing with the numbers in the payoff matrix. In the real world, we can think of it as the costs of leaving a treaty, maybe financial penalties or loss of face globally, and so on. The movie The Hunger Games provides an interesting example of this. The rules of The Hunger Games initially permit only one victor. It's a fight to the death, and the last person standing is the winner. But partway into the games, the game makers change the rules and permit two winners, provided they're sunk from the same district. What effect does this have on Katniss and Peeta, our movie's protagonists, and their choices? Let's think about that in game theoretic terms. Under the original payoff matrix, there can be only one winner. If Katniss and Peeta must decide to cooperate or work together or rebel and try to kill one another, the incentive structure is clearly tilted heavily towards rebelling. Each, was, each one must eventually kill the other, and as a result, cooperation must be temporary and fleeting at best. But after the capital changes the structure and permits two winners from the same district, Katniss and Peeta's incentives change. Now, cooperation is their best strategy as it gives each of them an incentive to work together to defeat the other tributes, and it eliminates the incentive to defect, that is, to kill one another altogether. The lesson here is that payoff structures matter. Changing the payoffs, either by incentivizing cooperation or penalizing defection, changes the decision structure for the parties involved, likely leading to different outcomes. In addition to changing the payoff matrix, the introduction of external agents can also be employed to enforce agreements or to change payoff costs. In international relations, we see this when we have an independent third-party group monitoring compliance and ensuring that no one is shifting from their obligations. This was a common practice in arms control agreements between the U.S. and the USSR during the Cold War. Commitment devices can also be used to increase the cost of defection. Put simply, a commitment device is a way to lock in a particular course of action. On an individual level, we often use commitment devices to address discrepancies between short and long-term interests. There are lots of examples of commitment devices in global politics. 
One might be the Greek myth of Odysseus. During his tenure odyssey, Odysseus had many adventures, including at one point crossing paths with the Sirens. The Sirens were mythical creatures whose song was so enchanting that sailors would throw themselves overboard and swim to their deaths in an attempt to reach that sound. Odysseus ordered his men to plug their ears with wax so they wouldn't be tempted, but he wanted to hear the song of the siren himself, so he ordered his sailors to tie him to the ship's mast so he could hear the song without being lured to his death. We also have the story of the Chinese general Han Xin, uh, best remembered as a brilliant military tactician of the early Han dynasty. During one campaign, Han Xin reportedly ordered his troops to position themselves with their backs at the river in order to prevent them from retreating during the battle. Such a move is an example of a commitment device. The Doomsday Machine from the 1964 film Dr. Strangelove is yet another example of a commitment device. The film itself is a satire of Cold War nuclear policy, where a rebel American general has unilaterally launched a nuclear bomber to strike against the Soviet Union. In this scene, Soviet Ambassador Alexei Dissidinsky tells U.S. President Merkin Mifli about the Soviet Union's Doomsday Machine, a machine that will automatically respond to an American nuclear bomb attack with a full-scale Soviet attack that will destroy the world. Let's take a look at that scene. When it is detonated, it will produce an upheaval radioactive fallout so that within 10 months, the surface of the Earth will be as dead as the moon. Ah, come on. That's getting ridiculous. Our study showed that even the worst fallout is down to a safe level after two weeks. You've obviously never heard of Cabal Thorium G. Well, what about it? Cabal Thorium G has a radioactive half life of 93 years. If you take, say, 50 H bombs in the 100 megaton range and jacket them with Cabal Thorium G, when they are exploded, they will produce a doomsday shroud. A lethal cloud of radioactivity which will encircle the Earth for 93 years. Oh, what a load of commie bull. I mean, after all. Afraid I don't understand something, Alexei. Is the Premier threatening to explode this if our planes carry out their attack? No, sir. It is not a thing a sane man would do. The doomsday machine is designed to trigger itself automatically. But surely you can disarm it somehow? No. It is designed to explode if any attempt is ever made to untrigger it. Automatically? Ah, it's an obvious comic trick, Mr. President. We're wasting valuable time. Look at the big boy. They're getting ready to clobber us. But this is absolute madness, Ambassador. Why should you build such a thing? There were those of us who fought against it. But in the end, we could not keep up with the expense involved in the arms race, the space race and the peace race. And at the same time, our people grumbled for more nylons and washing machines. Our doomsday scheme cost us just a small fraction of what we've been spending on defense in a single year. But the deciding factor was when we learned that your country was working along similar lines and we were afraid of a doomsday gap. This is preposterous. I've never approved of anything like that. Our source was the New York Times. Dr. Strangelove. Do we have anything like that in the works? A moment, please, Mr. President. Under the authority granted me as Director of Weapons Research and Development, I commissioned last year a study of this project by the Bland Corporation. Based on the findings of the report, my conclusion was that this idea was not a practical deterrent, for reasons which at this moment must be all too obvious. Then you mean it is possible for them to have built such a thing? Mr. President, the technology required is easily within the means of even the smallest nuclear power. It requires only the will to do so. But how is it possible for this thing to be triggered automatically and at the same time impossible to untrigger? Mr. President, it is not only possible, it is essential. That is the whole idea of this machine, you know. Deterrence is the art of producing in the mind of the enemy the fear to attack. And so because of the automated and irrevocable decision-making process which rules out human meddling. The doomsday machine is terrifying. It's simple to understand and completely credible 
and convincing. Gee, I wish we had one of them doomsday machines, Dainty. But this is fantastic, strange love. How can it be triggered automatically? Well, it's remarkably simple to do that. When you merely wish to bury bombs, there's no limit to the size. After that, they are connected to a gigantic complex of computers. Now then, a specific and clearly defined set of circumstances under which the bombs are to be exploded is programmed into a tape memory bank. Hmm. A single roll of shape Strange love. can store all the information. What kind of a name is that? That ain't no crowd name, is it, Stanley? He changed it when he became a citizen. It used to be McVecht Lieber. Hmm. A crowd by any other name, I think. Is that the whole point of the doomsday machine is lost? If you keep it a secret, why didn't you tell the world, eh? It was to be announced at the party congress on Monday. As you know, the Premier loves surprises. In a sense, the doomsday machine from Dr. Strangelove is the ultimate example of a commitment device, completely removing any decision-making from the process whatsoever. The final wrinkle I want to throw into the Prisoner's Dilemma game is one that questions the premise of the game more broadly. The Prisoner's Dilemma is based on the assumption that we're all rational, self-interested actors. But what happens when those assumptions begin to break down? What happens, in other words, if we're interested in something other than our own self-interest? Let's go back to our Hunger Games example. After the Capitol changed the rules and incentivized cooperation, PETA and Katniss worked together to win the game. They manage to kill and outlast all of the other tributes until just the two of them are left. What happens next? The Capitol announces another rules modification that overturns the previous one, that there can be only now one winner of the games, and that Katniss and Peeta will have to fight to the death. What happens? Let's see. Attention, attention, tributes. There has been a slight rule change. The previous revision allowing for two victors from the same district has been revoked. Only one victor may be crowned. Good luck, and may the odds be ever in your favor. should go home. One of us has to die. They have to have their victor. No. They don't. Why should they? No. Trust me. Trust me. Now let's think about that example in just a bit more detail. What's interesting about that scene from a game theory perspective is that each should want to kill the other, but neither does. In fact, they're both willing to eat the berries, which would kill them both, in order to deny the capital their victor. At best, the individual incentives for each of them should be to not eat the berries. So what's going on here? Before answering that question, let's look at one more example. In the 2008 film Batman the Dark Knight, there's a great example of the prisoner's dilemma in action. Towards the end of the film, Gotham is being evacuated and there are two boats each leaving the city. 
The first boat is full of prisoners from the local jail, and the second is full of civilians from the city. Unbeknownst to both boats, the Joker, played by Heath Ledger in his final role, the Joker secretly loaded each with explosives and given the other boat that boat's detonator. Thus, the first boat can blow up the second boat, and the second boat can blow up the first boat. He's cut off communication between the boats and calls them to tell them both of their situation. He also informs them that if neither boat is destroyed, he'll blow them both up. This situation has all the telltale marks of the prisoner's dilemma, and the rational course of action working backwards is for each boat to blow up the other as quickly as possible. But in the movie, what happens? Unfortunately, Warner Brothers won't actually let me show you what happens, so you'll have to take my word for it. After much debate and considerable tension, neither boat blows the other up. Each waits, expecting the bomb on their boat to be detonated, but neither takes that step. So while both the Joker's boat dilemma in Batman and the Hunger Games Barry scene exhibit many of the characteristics of the prisoner's dilemma, in neither film does the prisoner's dilemma unfold as the classical game theory would suggest it should. Neither bloat blows up the other, and Katniss and Peeta are both willing to die rather than to win the game. Why? Why doesn't the classic version of the prisoner's dilemma hold in these cases? I suggest that the prisoner's dilemma in its rawest form fails to account for the broader social conceptions of right and wrong, of morality and social justice, or of, to put it bluntly, humanity. And it begins with the assumption that we're rational actors. Sometimes we are, but our rationality is broader than self-interest. And at other times, we're simply not. In fact, we're emotional beings with a very poor sense of, of judgment. But that's a topic for another video. So that concludes our brief look at Solutions to the Prisoner's Dilemma. I hope you found it useful, and if you find other examples of the Prisoner's Dilemma or game theory in movies or pop culture, please leave a comment below and let me know. Thanks everyone. Have a good day. Bye.